All right, guys, so we're going to take a look here at the semi control deck that I've put together here for Pomper. Um, if you don't get a chance, check out the article puremtgo.com. Uh, it kind of walks through how this came to be, but just the quick background if you saw some of the videos last week, I was playing a lot with blue black control and Pomper. Um, and that was really kind of working on, on the rogue format, something to kind of beat up on competitive decks for Pomper. Um, to me, competitive tournament play is not my idea of fun, so I wanted to get back towards a more casual form of Popper, but, you know, in transition I wanted to work with blue and, and keep some of my counter um, control going on. Now, we had already covered blue-black, and, you know, blue-red is already a strong deck, so, you know, I, I wanted to do something a little different, and that kind of left me with green. So, this was my starting point. Coiling Oracle. It's a cute little 1-1. One -one. Um, one of my absolute favorite cards that you know has ever been. Uh, you play him for a blue and a green, and you reveal the top card. If it is a land, it goes into play. If not, you get the draw card. But it's revealed, and your opponent knows it. No big deal. Um, you know this is it's great. It's it's got acceleration, um, land ramp, hand draw. You know just it's it's cute. It's got everything in one little package. Um, so this was really my starting point, you know, and I had this little creature, and I'm like, you know what, this is it, this is definitely where I want to start. Um, now, to go along with that, you know, I clearly wanted to bring in uh, some counter control, and that's where we came into play with these, you know. I decided I wanted to run a full set of rune snags. Now, this is kind of an interesting choice. Um, there are a lot of decent counter spells in, you know, this format. Um, counterspell is a solid one, you know, there's nothing getting around that, if they want it to stop, they have to counter that. Um, but because we're running two colors, I wanted to feature a counterspell that had a colorless in the cost. And that's kind of where Rune Snag came in. Now I did have options, I could have brought in Mana Leak as opposed to Rune Snag. Um, but I like the fact that Rune Snag ramps up. Uh, come, come the late game with Mana Leak, it is not as powerful. Um, you get that late game, and people are more likely to have three mana available to stop that from happening. Um, Rune Snag is not so powerful when it comes to the first one. The first one is only going to cost two to prevent. But as you ramp those up, you know it gets harder and harder to stop that. So I really wanted to bring in that full package of Rune Snags. Um, I also, you know, didn't want to run, like I said, the full package of counter spells because I am running green mana sources. Um, I just wanted to, to be more likely to play them. I mean, it is heavy blue, but still, um, I wanted to, to really feature counter spells that had that colorless mana in them. Um, I also brought in two copies of Prohibit. I think this is a great card. Um, you had a lot of stuff with this card. Um, there's a lot of the most powerful spells you'll find in Pauper are in the two cost, um, and when you pay that kicker cost, you're going to be able to hit probably, I want to say, 90% of the spells that you're going to run into for Pauper. Um, will be caught at 4 mana or below for a constant cost. Um, now I wanted to, to run something else alongside this control. If you run, you know, blue-black, you're running counter spells and you're running hand destruction. And, you know, that's really the, the two main control aspects. Now, this has the counter spell package, but I wanted something else. Um, and what I, I decided and what I came up with was I wanted to run a bit of land control. So what I did, I brought in four copies of Thermokarst as kind of the best um, land destruction you can get in these colors. Um, and that outright destroys land. If it's a snow land, you gain life. Now, you're not likely to ever hit that um, on the occasion that you do, you know, fantastic. Uh, but it's not really why it's there. Now, alongside that, I'm running four copies of Spreading Seas. Now, this is a card. I, I more likely started with this card. Um, I feel that this card is land control that is more player-friendly. Um, when you play Spreading Seas, it changes the color of a land. It doesn't destroy it. Thermal Karst, it destroys the land. It is setting your opponent back. He is having a harder time producing um, mana. With this, it just basically changes it so that he still has the land, but now it will not provide the color he needs. Um, another, you know, One of the, the big focuses I had with this deck, and you'll see it in the article and if you check out the videos, is I really wanted to shut down some of the lands in, in, that you find in this format. Um, you know, I've run into a lot of tournament decks in the casual room, and I really want, you know, something that is not tournament-ready, but it holds up to that. Um, 
And by running this package of eight land control spells, you really have given yourself quite an advantage against decks that run the post lands. Cloud post, glimmer post. Um, you are able to shut those down. You have one kill spell for each of those lands. So, you know, that's pretty fantastic right there. Um, you know, you can shut those down. The other big thing that you run into is these, um, the growth chamber, these, these Ravnica lands. Um, I don't know the, you know, proper term for these, but these basically popper duels, um, is what I'm going to call them. Um, they give you big trouble when you come into you know, the fissure storm and stuff like that. They can really produce lands, um, really produce mana that's, that's troublesome. And even if your opponent isn't running those, getting these early land control spells into play are really going to slow him down. And that's all you really want out of this, is you want to slow down your opponent, you want to be able to take care of those things um, on an as-needed basis, and just, you know, just control the tempo of the game. It's all about controlling tempo. Uh, so next thing, we wanted to, to work on the draw engine, and I decided to bring in four copies of Accumulated Knowledge. Now, I did originally go back and forth between this and Think Twice. Um, I like Think Twice. Um, I also like Accumulated Knowledge. Both, you know, if you have a playing preference, bring one of the o over the other, feel free. Um, I kind of like the fact that Accumulated Knowledge in the mid to late game, when you have multiple copies in the graveyard, is kind of a heavier draw spell. Um, think Twice is always going to draw you a single card for its cost. If Accumulated Knowledge, you have two copies in the graveyard, you're going to be able to draw more cards off the third copy than you would with a third copy of Think Twice. Um, so, I mean, you know, I'm not going to do the math, I'm not a good math person as far as which is going to net you more, but, you know, it's it's nice at, in the mid to late game when you've, you know, emptied your hand to, to get that third accumulated knowledge and, and draw that many cards, it really is a good buff, buffer, sorry. Um, the Sphinx Seas also adds to draw spell. Uh, you will also run into a lot of blue lands, you know, opponents playing islands, blue control, etc., etc., um, where this really isn't going to be necessary, but you still play it. You know, realize the fact that it is not going to slow your opponent down, but play it as a cantrip. Um, basically, this would be a think twice without flashback. Um, you can think of it that way. Uh, just you know, something to keep in mind later on. Now, I wanted more draw because I'm I'm really when it comes to draw spells. I mean, I've got the oracle is giving me hand ramp. I got accumulated knowledge. It's just giving me ramp. I got spreading seas. More cards. Um, these are not technically as powerful as, say, you know, um, a Mull Drifter. So I wanted just even more card draw, and I wanted to do something fun. So here's what I did. I brought in three copies of Cartographer. Now, Cartographer is a creature card that works. Um, it's a 2-2, and when it comes into play, enters the battlefield, return a land from your graveyard to your hand. Now, this is great. Um, this gives us an option. We can use the Cartographer. We can get back Evolving Wilds. Um, if you're in the mid to late game, you want to thin more land out of your deck, perfect. Play a Cartographer, get the Evolving Wilds back, replay it. If you're short of color, um, this deck really wants a second green and a second blue. If you're ever short those, then you can use the Cartographer. Get back the Evolving Wilds, find the land you need. No problem. Excuse me. Now, where this really comes into play as a draw engine is we run two copies of the Tranquil Thicket and two copies of Lonely Sandbar. And with these, you can cycle these lands, draw a card off that, play the cartographer, and return the cycled land back to your hand. Now, this isn't any kind of broken abuse thing. It's just, you know, a quality interaction that, you know, it's it's not overpowered. It's just casual. It's fun. Um, you can get some pretty good card draw off that, especially if you get these, um, all three of these cartographers in a game. You know, you can really hit it. Now, one of the things I like to do, you know, we are running four of these. There are going to be points in time where we have to put these in play to meet mana, or a Coiling Oracle will hit one of those lands and put it into play. So we're going to bring in two copies of the, the Summit Growth Chamber so that we can bounce these back to our hand. Um, if these end up on the field, you can bring it back to your hand through the Growth Chamber and then be able to cycle it, and that's really what you want to do with these. You want to cycle these lands. Um, also, along that note, you want to hold the cartographers until you have this, this land draw going on. Um, if you have to, you know, like I said, if your color's screwed, you need extra land, more than happy to bring this in to get an Evolving Wilds, but I will hold on to it a little longer just to make sure that I, I get one of these cycling lands to get that going. Um, so yeah, we're going to bring in two copies of this, this growth chamber as well. So that kind of covered the, the draw spells, it covered the counter spells. Um, now we're we're looking at a bit of a problem as far as creature control goes. 
Uh, this deck is very light. We're only running 12 creatures, and, you know, the, the Quinlan Oracles aren't going to be anything worth messing with. Um, you wanted the, the ability to take care of any creature that made it onto the field. You want to hold these counter spells as long as possible, use them specifically to prevent creatures from coming into play, because once they're in play, you're not sitting pretty at all. Um, you're going to have a hard time getting rid of those. We don't have any actual kill spells in these colors, so what you're going to need to do is just bounce them. Um, one of the, the best ones that, that has come out is Vapor Snag. It only costs the one blue to return a creature to your owner's hand, and that person, um, the controller, loses a life. So, excuse me, um, this is actually a, a really great card to have. It can work for you both offensively and defensively. You can use it to replay a cartographer. Um, like I said, you have three copies, and if you get the draw engine going with these and the cycling lands, you get all three into play, and if you have to use a Vapor Snag on those, I mean, you're looking at pretty good card draw netted off that. Um, you also get to use those if you want to use an Oracle again. Um, and I will talk about the Shamblers in a minute, but you do have options to use these defensively. Uh, save a Drake, something like that. Um, so these, you know, it's it's really great. Like I said, y your only creature control is really going to be on the counter spells. So if by whatever reason they, you know, manage to, you know, slip one by you, this is the, the best you can do um, to really kind of take that into control. So let's look at the creatures real quick. Um, when I had originally had this deck put together, version 1, um, I had put in four copies of Delver of Secrets. Now this, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, I was not so concerned with the fact that the Delver... It, it, how do I want to say this? Um, I had the Delver in there not so much to be the overpowered body that it is in a heavy deck where it's going to flip right away. Um, I wanted it, you know, I didn't care so much that it flipped on the first turn it was able to attack, because, you know, I just needed a big body with some evasion to kind of get my win condition going. You know what I mean? I wanted, I wanted it to flip eventually, and when it did, be able to swing and, and win. Um, it really did not work so great in this deck. This deck does run 23 lands, um, which is a little bit heavy for Delver, not too bad. Um, it does run 12 creatures, again, a little bit heavy for Delver, not so bad, but this is kind of one of the other big things that kind of slows you down, because you have four spreading seas in here, and these spreading seas will not flip the Delver. Um, the Delver does state it's only instants and sorceries, so these four enchantments are going to slow you down even more. Um, there really wasn't a very heavy enchantment, or sorry, a heavy instant or sorcery base to this deck to get that going. So while it, it was working as a win condition, it really just was not paying off. Um, you know, if I had four, it was my creature count was up to 13. Um, so what I did is I went for another big-bodied flyer, uh, Stitch Drake. Now, this is a great card. It's, it can actually block the Delver and survive um, a transformed Delver. So it's a bigger body than that, toughness-wise, for a little bit higher cost. Um, and it works really well with this deck because of the fact that you have these four oracles. Um, most of the time these are going to be used as chump blockers. They are easily going to go to the grave. Any kind of creature spell, kill spell, is going to enable you to get this drake out really early. Now this drake is going to be your win condition in a lot of games. You are going to be able to swing through for three in the air and win it. Um, you know, it really kind of filled that need I had for evasion for a big body. Um, even more so because it, it can survive like a lightning bolt, something like that. So, you know, it was definitely the right idea. So, I took out one of the Delvers and brought in a new Vapor Snag. Um, so, yeah, I, I, sorry, um, I took out one of the Delvers, I brought in a third Vapor Snag, which really acted as a, you know, a really kind of necessary balance. You know, the, the Delvers wouldn't always flip. Um, the Vapor Snag added one more chance to provide us some on on battlefield creature control um, and it really worked out well so I also wanted a little more control I brought in two of these mold shamblers now this is something um, it, it's kind of an interesting thing it works as both land destruction and con and control for any kind of pesky artifacts equipments enchantments that may have hit the field um, you know in the white version you do get oblivion rings you do get you into nowhere and you have the shambler and he can take care of that with this kicker uh, the deck doesn't exactly ramp mana, but it does have a lot of opportunities to get heavy mana in the mid to late game. So casting this for um, six is not so bad. Um, it, it's definitely something that is doable. Um, 
Now, kind of the, the last thing I want to talk about, and perhaps an odd choice here, is I do put in a single Sprout Swarm. Now, this deck is not an aggro deck, it's a kind of mid-range control deck. Um, we're running only 12 creatures, so you can have problems with fast aggro decks. Now, I have run into a lot of games where the Sprout Swarm has actually been very beneficial, uh, providing chump blockers, providing, you know, just extra damage, um, eating counterspells, stuff like that. Uh, now, you know, that dies, it doesn't provide a creature body for the Drake, but, you know, sometimes that 1-1 one, one token creature is just what you need, and if you don't, you know, kind of don't believe me, check out some of my example games. Um, there's at least two in there where you can see the, the effect Swarm has on the game. Um, just, you know, stalling your opponent, anything like that, it's it's really good. Um, it's it's a little bit of an odd one of where you don't have any tutor or anything like that. Um, to me, it's kind of like a catch-all for, you know, just, just a leftover opening. I really, you know, it's, it is, it's an odd thing. I don't know why I put it in there, but I, I really think it's important to the deck. Um, you can feel free to take it out. You know, maybe it's just my play style, maybe the way I, I like to do things. You can feel free to take this out. No, oh, sorry about that. Um, take this card out, throw it in a third chambler, you know, something like that would really be beneficial. Um, you know, you can do a lot of things uh, with this this one card spot. Bring in a, another counter spell and prohibit fourth counter spell, other vapor snag, anything like that. But I, I think it's something you should at least try out before you, you take it out. Um, so that's the deck. There isn't really a sideboard for it because it is casual, but um, you know I, I do suggest you you take a look here. You give it a try. If you don't, you know, like how it looks, at least watch the the example games beforehand. And finally, uh, of course, check out the article when it shows up on PureMTGO.com.